Yeah. Hi, Becky. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah. I am the director of financial aid here at Gonzaga, and I'm here today representing both financial aid and really student financial services as a whole and happy to be here to share a bit more about the process. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and additionally, we're going to have several other colleagues who's going to be helping us manage the chat and polls for today's webinar. Um, so I would love it if my two admissions counselors in the chat would introduce themselves. So Levi, if you want to go first. Hi, everyone. I'm Levi Garcia, admission counselor here at Gonzaga. Thanks for being out here tonight. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah, and I am another admission counselor at Gonzaga, and welcome in. Awesome. And then if we could have our financial aid staff, um, Kelly, if you would like to go first. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Kelly Wentz, and I'm the Associate Director of Student Employment here. Excited to answer some questions for you. And then we actually also have Helen Van Blair come with us. She's our office manager here in Student Financial Services, and she's also anxious to answer your questions as well. Awesome, thank you. Becky, I'm up, I believe. So if we can go to the next slide, that would be awesome. Because before we dive into kind of how to apply financial aid and really the process, I wanna take a moment and highlight our mission and approach to assisting students and families with applying for financial aid. Uh, we're really committed to Gonzaga's mission, and we hope that you see that through our service and our policies. We see our role not only to assist students and families with resources for attending Gonzaga, but also to develop and educate students through our work. Um, I talk all day long sometimes with families about this stuff. I understand how deeply personal finances can be. Um, so know that if you do not get your questions answered today, either through this presentation or through the Q&A, that you have um, an awesome team that is ready to help. Please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, we take a team approach to helping students. Um, we will share contact information a little bit later, but know that there is an experienced um, financial aid staff. We also are well staffed. There's rarely a wait time to get a hold of us. Um, and we really take pride in our commitment to students. Financial aid can be confusing. I've worked in this for nearly 20 years and I still get confused by it. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out um, and know that we're happy to provide more personalized assistance, particularly around those more sensitive financial issues. So let's dive in. Um, before we get to the how to apply for financial aid, um, I wanted to kind of start with a high level overview about what financial aid is. And essentially the broadest definition is that financial aid is funded, funding providing, provided to students to help pay for post-secondary educational expenses or another way, you know, college or higher education expenses. So with that like overarching philosophy, there's a few goals of financial aid. Um, and I think it's important to kind of understand these um, to, to know how this process works. The first goal of financial aid is to distribute limited resources. So unfortunately, college isn't free um, for most people. Um, generally, families are having to pay some amount to attend school and the resources that are available for college are limited. And that includes resources from the school, from the government. Um, and from other sources. So that's one of the, the purposes of this whole application process is to figure out how to distribute resources. Part of that too is to ensure that there's an equitable evaluation of a family's ability to pay. Um, so you're, you're gonna hear us talk about the FAFSA application um, and that's important and allows us to kind of measure all families using the same methodology. But really more important, and, and one of the reasons I really love this work, is that we get to assist students in realizing their goals of attending college or choosing a college, of accessing college, and then sort of um, being retained at that college and, and seeing them through to graduation. So um, those are just kind of the broad overarching goals. And you'll hear me say this a few times through this webinar, but I also think it's really important to note that college financial aid offices like us at Gonzaga, we're required to coordinate financial aid for all of the students that attend Gonzaga. And that's important because you might be getting financial aid communication from different resources, um, but know that all of it kind of comes together through the school's financial aid office. 
Awesome. And before moving on to any different types of financial aid, um, we just wanted to highlight some information specific to our international students. So I saw that that um, question just popped up in the chat. So hopefully this helps get some of your questions answered. Um, but first things first, uh, for international students who apply through Gonzaga Global, there's going to be some differences in the range of scholarship award amounts um, and eligibility eligibility for GU institutional scholarships. Um, so first year and transfer international students who apply through the standard route, non-global, um, they're going to be eligible for GU institutional scholarships that do not require the FAFSA. Um, so those international students are still eligible for some of our application-based scholarships, mostly based on like merit and everything to do going into your application for that holistic review process as well. Um, but definitely one of our big things is make sure you review um, uh, gonzaga.edu slash international for some more more information about that because it really provides like all the different resources when it comes to financial aid for international students. So definitely a good website to check out, have in your back pocket going through the um, international student admission process too. Um, but international students on an F1 student visa are eligible to work on campus. Um, and this can be a really important funding source in addition to being able to gain work experience while being a student. Um, so our international student and scholar services team provide immigration support for S F1 students to gain work experience directly related um, to a student's field of study while they're a student. Um, so curricular practical training, CPT, and post-graduation optional practical training as well. So definitely something that I think could be a really great resource specifically for international students, but also for a bunch of different other students on campus as well. So on that note, we really want to send a poll question just to get people starting to get involved and really um, talking about these different financial aid opportunities. So we're going to have several polls throughout the webinar, but we'd like to start with, um, do you plan to work while you are in college? Um, so we're going to have that question launched in our on um, online, and please feel free um, to check off one of the answers to that question. We would love to see um, your results too. We'll give you guys a few seconds to start answering that question. Um, just take a moment. Do you plan on working while you are in college? Um, so I'm seeing a lot of yeses right now. Some not sure. That's okay. You don't have to know right now. Um, and definitely something that is a really great opportunity for students. So I'll give it one more minute. Looks like we have a lot of our people already responding to this question. Um, but we'll go ahead and end that poll really quick. And I would love to share the results with all of you. So over half of you guys, 62% are really looking towards like working on college. That's an amazing goal to have and definitely a great opportunity for students. And some of you not so sure, but maybe you guys need to hear a little bit more about those opportunities on our college campus too. Um, but awesome. Great to see you guys. Yeah, I'm sure Kelly is really pleased with those results as the uh, chief student employment advocate. Um, but that kind of leads us into our next slide, which is types of financial aid. I will get to employment in just a second, um, but I'm going to start with gift aid. So as you go through the financial aid process, you're likely going to hear lots of different ways to describe types of aid. And one really important distinction to keep track of is whether or not the financial aid you're offered is gift aid or self-help aid. Gift aid is just like it sounds. It comes in the forms of grants and scholarships, and it's money that doesn't need to be repaid. It can be based on financial need or merit. A sort of like loose rule is that grants are typically based on financial need and scholarships are typically based on merit, although that is not a hard and fast rule. And there are certainly plenty of merit based grants and need based scholarships or things that are based on kind of the combination of both. And then as we were just discussing, student employment might also be a part of your financial aid offer. And one of the most frequently asked questions we get is how to work on campus and about work opportunities on campus. So um, there is the broad umbrella of student employment, which is a service that we help connect students with jobs on campus. And then there is a financial aid program or financial aid programs called work study. And these programs are based on financial need, um, but don't be discouraged if you don't see it on your financial aid offer that, because there are so many opportunities to work on campus, especially at Gonzaga. 
One of the great things about working on campus or working through a work study program is that employers and supervisors are going to be more accommodating, um, really accommodating actually, to students' schedules and the demands of um, full-time academics. So we have several student workers in our office and we try to be as flexible as possible um, to, you know, they have a big test they need to study for or some sort of academic thing that they're pursuing or even a student activity. We understand that they're at Gonzaga to be students first and um, really really do our best to accommodate that. And so not only is student employment a great way to earn money, it's also just a really great way to connect with the campus and community and gain work experience. We have about 1,600 students of our roughly 5,000 work on and off campus each year. And again, I want to say maybe three, 400 or so are in the need-based work program. So you can see there's lots of opportunities to work on campus, even if you are not in, uh, not awarded need-based work. Another type of financial aid program is loans, and loans sometimes get a bad rap in the media. There's been lots of attention on loans and loan reform in the last few years. Um, they are a really important tool to make college more accessible for millions of students every year. Now, of course, we're going to encourage you to borrow wisely and only what you need. Um, and I have a little bit more information later on about more specifics about the different types of loans that might be available through the financial aid process. The other um, types of financial aid that you might consider, and I just kind of dropped these in here. These are kind of specific, but some families aren't aren't aware that there may be additional steps to qualify for those. So um, veterans education benefits, if you um, or the student's parents are, are military connected, you might want to look and see if you qualify for any veterans education benefits or if there's any remaining eligibility. Um, I was working with a family last year that weren't wasn't aware that they qualified for those and actually ended up getting a fair amount of money through that process. There also may be waivers, like tuition waivers available um, through a parent's employer, or there might be a, a benefit um, through an employer available. So I mentioned these just to kind of plant a seed and see if um, any of those pertain to you. Again, these are going to be other types of financial aid from organizations that you have connections to. So I'll turn it over to Becky for another poll question. Awesome. So to get us thinking a little bit more about the financial aid process, um, we would love to know in this anonymous poll, uh, how many of you guys are planning to submit the FAFSA application once it is released? Um, so please answer the poll you're going to see pop up on your screen in a couple um, seconds, but it's basically, do you plan to submit a FAFSA this year, um, especially with everything going on with the new FAFSA application? So we'd love to hear from you guys. So Awesome. We'll give you a few seconds just to see what you guys are thinking. Awesome. Great to see. Love seeing those yeses. Awesome. Some not sure, some no. Awesome. All right. It looks like we got most of you in. So I'll go ahead and end that poll. And then I'm going to share the results to everyone, too, so you guys can kind of check that out. Um, so most of you are planning on submitting a, F a FAFSA application. So that's a really great opportunity for students um, to not only get considered for financial aid, but some scholarships that might require a little mix of both financial aid and merit. Um, so definitely something that we highly encourage students to do, even if you don't think you're going to qualify for any financial aid. Um, definitely no harm in that as well. Thanks, Becky. Yeah. Um... A hundred percent. So I, there's a couple of questions I see. I just want to touch on real quick before we get to the sources of financial aid. Um, there will be in just a couple of minutes, I will go through the updates for the FAFSA application. So trust that we're not going to leave you wondering what's going on with the FAFSA. We will share everything we possibly can that we know. Um, and then I noticed on the last side, uh, thank you, Frank, for pointing this out. Um, I failed to mention something called income share agreement. So I want to be clear that Gonzaga does not have income share agreements, but it might be a type of financial aid that you'd be offered in the process. And essentially it is an agreement to pay back a certain percentage of your salary um, in the five or 10 years after graduation. Usually um, it is essentially a type of loan. Um, I would really scrutinize that, that availability. Um, I don't think it has as many federal um, protections like consumer protections as some other financial tools, um, but it, it has sort of 
become a little bit more trendy to have that be a part of financial aid packages recently. Gonzaga does not offer that though. Um, so let's go ahead. I think we need to go back a slide and talk about where all the money comes from. Um, and really, it is a variety of sources. Um, Becky, uh, we just got a sneak peek. Becky's going to talk about how to qualify for financial aid at Gonzaga. And really, most of the financial aid, I want to say, you know, 120 million of the roughly 200 million dollars in financial aid Gonzaga award students comes from institutional aid, which is money that Gonzaga provides to students to attend school. Um, the broader like nationwide stats are that 85% of students at four year private colleges are receiving some type of financial aid at um, their institution. Um, the next biggest source is going to be from the federal government or the United States Department of Education. And the most popular programs from the federal government are going to be the federal Pell Grant and SCOG Grant. And then, of course, um, there are federal direct loans, um, which are, again, a, a big source of funding for lots of students and make college accessible for lots of students. Um, I'm a proud Washingtonian and proud that we live in a state with a great financial aid program. Um, so Washington State Aid is for Washington residents attending school in Washington, um, but it really is an awesome and generous grant and can be up to $10,000 per year. Uh, the main grant program is called the Washington College Grant. Students who committed to being college bound in middle school might also be eligible for the college bound scholarship. And then there are some other smaller scholarship programs that are targeted for specific populations like foster youth and that sort of thing. And then I touch on this already, um, outside scholarships and other sort of resources might be available to students as well. Awesome. Great. Yeah, no. So now I jumped the gun a little bit, but um, now kind of getting into like putting students and families first, like and what that means at Gonzaga University, both on financial aid side of thing, as well as the admission side of thing. Um, but one thing we're going to shift specifically to scholarships. So um, getting into like what we consider in terms of scholarships at Gonzaga. So at Gonzaga, the majority of first year and transfer students receive scholarships to help finance their education. So it's a notably high percentage of this aid came in the form of merit scholarships and need-based grants. Uh, but 99% of our first year students receive scholarships and or grants at Gonzaga University. Um, and 93% of our transfers also receive institutional aid. So just something to know, I know we have a few transfer students um, online today. So just wanted to make sure like we hit you guys as well too. Um, so Gonzaga first year and transfer applicants are automatically reviewed for those merit scholarships. So if admitted, students receive those merit scholarships with their acceptance packet too. Um, so a student's merit scholarship, one of the biggest thing is it's not going to to decrease during your four years at Gonzaga University. Um, and Gonzaga's four-year graduation rate is 74%. Um, and right now the national average is actually right around 40 to 45% in a given year. So yes, like we love you at Gonzaga, but we also want to see you go on to those bigger and better things after those four years at GU. Um, in our admission process, we're test optional, and this means that you don't need to submit an SAT or ACT score to at Gonzaga to be considered for admission. Um, and this also remains true for our merit scholarship process too. So students without test scores are still considered for the same merit scholarships, and they're at no disadvantage by not submitting those merit scholarships as well. Awesome. And then kind of going off from that, in addition to merit scholarships, Gonzaga offers um, additional scholarships, which students can also be considered for. So while most of our scholarship students are automatically considered for just by applying to Gonzaga, we do have a few scholarships still that require a separate application. So to see these updates and scholarships um, that may require a separate application, please continue to check out. It's called gonzaga.edu slash scholarships this fall um, as we continue to update any of our scholarship opportunities. So most of them are already posted with the deadlines, and those deadlines are usually around January 1st for those separate applications. Um, but we also offer other things like our alumni scholarship and our academic departments too. So things like our music scholarships on campus. Um, so those might have different deadlines, but music scholarships on campus, those um, are usually due about February 12th this year is the date those are going to be due, and those require a separate audition process. But lots of opportunities, no matter what your academic major of interest is. 
um, to get those additional scholarships involved too through the separate applications. But our students also bring in over $2.5 million annually in outside scholarships. Um, so outside scholarships are awarded by various organizations throughout your community. Um, so common places to search for outside scholarships can consist of churches, service organizations, your parent or guardian's um, employer, and definitely a lot more places to look at in addition to that. But your high school counseling office should be a really great resource for you to use um, throughout that scholarship search process because you never know what's out there until you start looking, right? Um, and we definitely recommend that you begin your scholarship search at the local level because that application pool is likely to be a little bit smaller. Um, so it kind of makes you a little bit more competitive within that pool too. So Washington State students should look into the Maxwell Foundation, Independent Colleges of Washington and washboard.org for those opportunities. But those are different across different states too. So I'm sure California, Oregon, all these different places offer those opportunities as well. Um, and then now kind of moving into um, Gonzaga's financial aid office also maintains like a really fantastic external scholarship database. It's something that I used when I was looking at Gonzaga University, and it's something that I think is so, so fantastic. Um, so it provides links to different scholarships through private organizations from around the United States. So if you're looking at the local level, but not having too much luck, um, definitely use this as a great resource to kind of start branching out a little bit too. So these scholarships tend to be larger in the number of applicants, but can still be a really great resource for you and your scholarship so scholarship search. Sorry about that. And for families that may have multiple Zag siblings enrolled at Gonzaga University um, during the same semester or year, we do have a tuition discount, which I think is really fantastic for students. So if you have a sibling attending GU right now, or if you know you have some younger siblings trickling in over the years after that, um, this tuition discount provides the older student with 10% off tuition. Um, and if you have a third Zag on campus, the oldest student would then get 20% and the middle child would then get 10% off of that as well. And then just to getting into like more um, students who are military connected. So whether you're a student veteran who's looking to attend GU or you're the dependent of a service member, um, use of those military education benefits um, is a really available option here at Gonzaga. Um, and we've highlighted here just a few of those available programs utilized by enrolling students. Um, but these include the post 9-11 GI Bill and associated yellow ribbon program as well. Um, as, and then we also have the Montgomery GI Bill, Chapter 35 for survivors and dependents, as well as vocational rehabilitation benefits too. Um, it is important to note that there is a process for transferring service member benefits to a dependent through the Department of Defense. Um, and dependents in return, you must apply to the VA to transfer that entitlement to the university. So just something to note for you guys. Um, and families, as well as student veterans, are encouraged to build a timeline to complete these tasks when they're preparing for the application process. Um, but they're welcome to contact Gonzaga's benefits coordinator, Mike Grabowski. Um, he's noted here for any additional advising and assistance navigating the process too. But once a student has confirmed their enrollment to, to our university and registered for classes, benefits will be certified through that VA office each and every semester to make sure you're on the right track for everything too. Thanks, Becky. Um, let's just take a second to dive into a little bit more detail about loans. Again, we kind of set this presentation up on sort of the resources that we hope that you'll consider first. And loans is, again, like the, the next um, option. Um, we want to see students get as much gift aid as possible. So again, loans are going to be a part of a financial aid offer, and you are not at all required to take them. Um, it is an optional resource for students and families to help finance education. And students who are going to be, um, who have financial aid, excuse me, students who have financial need are going to be eligible to borrow in the federal subsidized loan program. And that loan program does not accrue interest while the student's in school, which is a really awesome benefit. So if the student can pay off the loan the day after they graduate, um, the loan would not have accrued any interest. All the students who are eligible to apply for a FAFSA application, so like U.S. citizen, has a high school diploma, um, all those students are going to be eligible for a type of federal loan called a direct unsubsidized loan program. This does not require financial need, um, but the combination of these programs does have some annual loan limits, which is about $5,500 for the first year. And if borrowing in these programs isn't enough, parents can also borrow through a federal loan program known as a Parent PLUS loan. And 
or the student could consider borrowing additional loans from a bank or financial institution. And we refer to those as private loans. Um, both the Parent PLUS loan and private loans are going to require some sort of credit check or the absence of negative credit, but there are sort of co-signing options and it doesn't necessarily have to be the parent co-signing with the student in the case of a private loan. So applications for the Parent PLUS and alternative loans are not going to be available till the springtime, unfortunately, um, because there is that credit-based component. We have to make sure that the credit check doesn't expire, um, but it's usually available by April. So if you are anxious to know whether or not you might qualify, know that you'll have the opportunity um, in the spring and that we will try to make the information available. And I believe we have one more poll question. Awesome. Yeah, it looks like we have one more poll question coming out. Um, so this poll is going to be only one FAFSA application. It's a true or false question. Only one FAFSA application is submitted during your college education. Is that true or false? It's a couple true, some false. We're, we're seeing the polls go back and forth a little bit right now. Okay, good to see. A lot of you answering in. Okay. All right, I'm going to end this poll right now. Perfect. So I'm ending and I'm going to share the results out. So we got a lot of answers for false. So false is the correct answer. So um, the FAFSA application is something that you have to update every single year um, for those financial aid opportunities. So for those of you that answered true, so glad that you're on this webinar. We can kind of chat through what that looks like too. Um, but definitely something that I did not know when I started at Gonzaga University and I had to go to the financial aid office to chat through my financial aid opportunities. So I'm glad we asked the question. Yeah, so the, the FAFSA is an annual application, um, and we encourage students to every year. Um, but I will say, and I, I didn't get to emphasize this earlier, um, or maybe I did, and I just can be a broken record about it, but if cost is in any way a factor for your college decision, particularly in this first year, I would encourage you to submit a FAFSA, even if you don't think you're going to qualify. Um, different schools use different measures of financial need, um, and I think even at Gonzaga, there are you know, we often shock families with need-based aid when they didn't think that they would qualify for anything. So let's talk about probably the reason a lot of you are on here, which is how to now apply for this financial aid and particularly what's changing with the FAFSA application. To sort of just get a baseline understanding, um, let's talk about what the FAFSA is and then I will get into the changes. So the FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. We will almost always refer to it as the FAFSA and it is the form that you fill out to apply for financial aid from the federal government. It's also the form that you fill out to apply for state financial aid and need-based financial aid from schools like Gonzaga. Um, submitting the FAFSA is the most important thing and really a requirement um, that you have to do if you want financial aid. And of course, when I say it's a requirement, I mean for students who would otherwise be eligible for the financial aid, I'm sorry, would be otherwise eligible to submit the FAFSA like a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizens. And we have some information if you don't fall into one of those categories about how to apply for financial aid. Another really important thing to know about the FAFSA is that it's free. Um, you don't need to pay anyone to prepare it for you. And I can tell you with 100% confidence that anyone who says they know what's going on with the application this year does not, um, as we do not have, um, we're getting uh, little tidbits and breadcrumbs of information, but we do not have a complete application. Um, and there's no one out there who essentially knows all the questions that's gonna ask. Um, because of the sort of delayed timeline this year, we're asking students to submit the FAFSA by February 1st. We expect it to be out sometime in December. Um, I My hunch is that it will be later December, but it should be um, no later than December 31st. And so January is when you would want to mark your calendars um, to submit the FAFSA application for students who are applying next fall. If you are a transfer student looking to um, a transfer mid-year and start with us in January, you can do the FAFSA at any time and we would encourage you to do it as soon as possible. 
So let's go ahead and talk about what's changing. So you might have heard this year's the FAFSA is undergoing some exciting changes. Um, that's one word for it. it, but really some long overdue modernization. And it's broadly known as the FAFSA Simplification Act. It's a law that Congress is essentially requiring the Department of Education to update the FAFSA application. And because of these changes um, and this overhaul, the FAFSA will not be available until December. Usually on this webinar, we'd be telling you to submit a FAFSA right now. It usually comes out in October, um, but we do not know the exact date just yet. Um, the changes sort of for all of this, the modernization, like I said, is long overdue. I've worked in this field for close to 20 years and really not much of this has been updated. And so um, I do think it'll ultimately be exciting, but you know, change is hard and there's a lot of um, students and families and colleges and college advocates that use this form. One other super awesome thing about the FAFSA simplification Act and the changes to the FAFSA is it's expected to expand access to the federal Pell Grant, meaning more students will be eligible for Pell, um, which is a really great benefit of this whole thing. So we can dive into a little bit more details about what's changing. Um, so the FAFSA application cycle for next year might be a bit bumpy as we all learn this new process and adapt to new systems, but know that ultimately these this is a great thing. Um, and again, know that we are also in this together and do not hesitate to reach out if you need help. There are a few specific changes I want to highlight to help you prepare. prepare. Um, as I mentioned, the FAFSA is expected to be available sometime in December. When the date is known, I um, can almost bet that there will be a massive uh, public relations campaign from the Department of Education, from schools, from your high school counselors, from other college advocates. So be sure to check your correspondence about the specific date or check in with those helping you uh, with the college process. Another change is the label for the output from the FAFSA. Um, previously, it was known as the expected family contribution, or I guess currently it's known as the expected family contribution. The name of that label is changing to the student aid index. The methodology is changing slightly, but it's largely the same. And I actually think student aid index is a much better name for this. Um, we use this figure as an index. Um, it is not the amount that families necessarily have to pay the school. Another sort of uh, good news um, change is that there are going to be fewer questions on the FAFSA and smart logic that most of us are accustomed to um, as we navigate the internet um, and sort of uh, you know know how websites work. The current FAFSA does not have a lot of smart logic built into it, and the new FAFSA is reported to have much better, um, much more intuitive user interface and design to make sure that students are able to submit only the information that they're required and that the questions are a lot more clear. Another exciting change is that information on the FAFSA is going to be transferred directly from the IRS to, to, to schools. Trust me if you haven't done the FAFSA that this is a bit of a hassle in our current FAFSA application. So um, there are you know, we are eagerly awaiting this change. It'll make things a lot uh, simpler and more accurate and require less verification work after the student has applied for aid. And finally, there's some new terminology. Um, the current FAFSA sort of works like one application. Going forward, um, it, it essentially will be one application, but it's more clearly divided up into three parts um, or two parts based on who needs to contribute. Um, we'll talk about which parent or parents will be on the FAFSA application here in a second, um, but generally speaking, there'll be a student contributor as well as a parent or parent contributors. Um, and then because the of the direct data exchange between the IRS and the FAFSA application, there is um, taxpayers essentially have to provide consent. Um, so essentially that's just granting permission to the Department of Ed to send your tax information to the FAFSA. So all in all good things, um, but it is change and there's lots of people who are gonna have to learn how to use this system in a very short period of time, but I am confident that we can get through it together. So I will turn it over to Becky to talk about other applications for students who are not eligible to submit a FAFSA. 
Awesome. Yeah. So getting into other aid applications um, and definitely something like for um, any students who are not eligible for federal aid for whatever reason, um, and this could be mainly because of like immigration status, um, including being undo uh, undocumented in the United States. Um, so the WASFA is the Washington Application for State Financial Aid, and that's something that we highly encourage students in this situation to please, please, please fill out. Um, but the WASFA is for students who are ineligible for federal financial aid due to their immigration status or being undocumented. So definitely something that is a really great resource for students and something we highly encourage you to fill out um, because there are some more opportunities for you um, to get that aid um, in addition to coming to Gonzaga University, right? Um, so you can start your application for that at wsac.wagov at was slash waspa. So I'll send that in the chat um, in a bit, uh, but the deadlines are the same as the FAFSA. Um, but one of the biggest things for this year, since we're not sure when the FAFSA is going to come out, um, we're still waiting on exactly when that WASPA deadline is going to be as well. So definitely something if any of my financial aid folks know the exact date, um, but I, I, as far as I last heard, um, you're still waiting to hear about that too. So feel free to chime in in the chat if you do know the date. Um, and then the needs analysis forms for non-residents of Washington State who um, want to be considered for additional Gonzaga financial aid. So the needs analysis form must be completed and submitted to the financial aid office by emailing it to finaid at gonzaga.edu. And this needs analysis form only needs to be completed once during a student's enrollment to be considered um, for those different um, financial aid addition, in addition to what you're having as well. But um, we do have another poll question coming in, um, and then feel free to keep on sending questions in the Q&A function. Um, but one of our poll questions coming up is you shouldn't file, it's a true or false again, but you shouldn't file a FAFSA if you think your family makes too much money. That's a true or false. So feel free um, to answer that question and um, we'll wait to see the results. But it's you shouldn't file a FAFSA if you think your family makes too much money. Awesome. So lots of, there we go. Lots of responses coming in. All right. So I'm going to end that poll and then I'm going to share the results to you all. Um, so yeah, most of you got said false, which is great. Um, so definitely something that if you don't think you're going to qualify for financial aid because you're worried that your family makes too much money, um, one of the that's one of the biggest misconceptions. It's definitely something anyone who you know anyone should fill out their FAFSA when applying to college. So definitely something we want to um, stress throughout this process, and definitely something that even if you're afraid that like you're not going to make it, your family makes too much money, that's definitely something to still um, fill out and make sure you never know what opportunities are out there for you as well. I'll stop sharing. So we have just a couple of common questions, and these go for both the WASPA and the FAFSA application. And common questions are, are maybe just frequent sort of mistakes or inaccuracies that we see. Um, the first one is around the investments that are included. Um, and this wording is a little awkward, but the, the question is which investments are excluded. So meaning that you don't have to include and you do not have to include um, retirement accounts on the FAFSA. So um, IRA, 401k, you do not have to include the value of those on the FAFSA application, nor do you have to include home equity or the primary residence um, the primary residence value of the home that you live in. Um, we see lots of families sort of over-reporting this information and, um, you know, it might sort of inflate a family's ability to pay, but those are not requirements for the FAFSA application. The next question, and this is actually changing with the new FAFSA, is who, what parent is required to be on the FAFSA? Um, so, Let's sort of take the case of a student who lives with both of their biological parents or both legal parents. And if that's the case, both parents' income information are going to be on the FAFSA, regardless of whether or not those parents are married or what the gender of the parents is, if those parents are living together. In the case where the parents don't live together, um, so maybe they're divorced or separated or never lived together, the student would 
report income information for the parent who provides the most financial support. Previously, it's who the parent or who the student lived with. And with the new FAFSA, it's changing to the parent that provides the most financial support. And then if that parent is remarried, um, it would also include the step parent's financial information, um, regardless of whether or not they're sort of intending or plan to sort of help financially provide for that student. And then the last question that we get is how education benefit plans are reported. So this might be like in Gonzaga, we have the GET program or Dream Ahead, Coverdell Savings Account, 529 Savings Plan. And these are going to be reported um, as the refund value in the student's assets. And the refund value should be um, available to you through whatever organization is sort of facilitating that plan that should be pretty easy to look up what the refund value is to know how to report it on the FAFSA application. Um, so if you have questions about what that might be, I would contact whatever organization is managing those investments for you. Awesome. And now kind of getting into like a brief timeline um, that we hope you refer to as you start your application with process with us at Gonzaga um, this fall, definitely. So first, you will want to get prepared by starting your common application or your transfer application and submitting that by the appropriate deadline. So next, get your documents organized and ready to apply early for the FAFSA or the WASFA once they become available to you um, to make sure that you're maximizing your aid here at Gonzaga and you get those um, responses for um, your financial aid packages and your merit scholarship packages too. But once your GU application and FAFSA or WASFA have been su successfully submitted, you're going to hear back from our admission office in late February with your admission decision. Um, and if you are admitted, then you will receive your financial aid offer shortly after. Um, and this this is the time when you really want to sit down and plan with your parents or guardian how you're going to decide if Gonzaga is the right fit for you financially and overall too. But your final step is then going to be to confirm your admission with us after you determine that we're the right fit for you guys. Um, and then you're going to celebrate the fact that you're going to become a Zag and, you know, starting here on the fall on campus where we get to see you um, and celebrate you as a new student on campus as well. So, of course, we need to cover kind of costs and what it might cost to attend Gonzaga. And one of the terms you're going to hear about as you navigate the financial aid process is the cost of attendance, um, which is super important. So, of course, it's a great idea to have an understanding of how much it's going to cost to attend a given school. And while we can't be super precise, particularly at this point in the process, um, there should be information available um, at all schools under what's called the cost of attendance. This cost of attendance is an all-inclusive figure, and when we talk about cost of attendance, we're really referencing two types of charges or, or costs that your student might incur. The first is direct costs, which I think are pretty obvious, but this would include things like tuition and maybe room and meal plans if you're going to be living on campus. But then there's also included in this total cost of attendance are indirect costs, which are items like books, transportation, personal expenses, and technology like a laptop. Um, these indirect costs are not things that Gonzaga is going to charge you directly. Um, they are just costs that might be incurred, but we're required as financial aid offices to include everything in this cost of attendance. And another thing to know um, is the terms and like eligibility for the financial aid that you're receiving. Um, again, we try to be as transparent and predictable as possible. And so know that you, if you are going to be studying in one of Gonzaga's amazing study abroad programs, um, you're also going to want to prepare for travel expenses associated with the program. If you're going to be studying in a sponsored program or like Gonzaga in Florence, which is technically still a Gonzaga program, your financial aid will transfer. Um, so that is a great benefit that um, students have at Gonzaga. Um, we in the financial aid office have an out-of-pocket cost worksheet um, that we will publish when we know more specifically the cost for next year. And it is a great way to kind of understand the direct and indirect costs and figure out a budget with your family. 
Awesome. And one more thing to touch on is um, here at Gonzaga, we have something called the Gonzaga Guarantee. So I saw it pop up in the chat in the Q&A a while ago. Um, but basically, we guarantee that all Gonzaga institutionally awarded funds upon entry to the university are going to remain the same throughout all four years and are not going to decrease during those four years at Gonzaga. So this includes need-based university grants, as well as both merit and application-based scholarships, too. And then one other thing I really want to touch on is the Gonzaga Access Pledge. So as a Jesuit school, um, Gonzaga is committed to doing more for others. And that's one of our really big things for students is making sure that if you want to come to Gonzaga and you're passionate about being a student here, we want to make sure that that's going to be possible for you. So we have different forms of those merit scholarships, financial aid, everything we've talked about. Um, but one other th cool thing that we have is with all these different forms of financial aid we've covered today, um, we work hard to make sure that Gonzaga is going to be a possibility for our students. So one one more step that we've taken is the Gonzaga Access Pledge or GAP. Um, and the Gonzaga Access Pledge at Gonzaga awards Pell Grant eligible Washington State residents who apply as first year students to have their tuition covered uh, from a combination of federal, state, and institutional financial aid resources as well. Um, so one good opportunity for our Washington State residents for sure. Um, and then following up from that, we also have a really other unique scholarship program that's just started this new this year. Um, and so Gonzaga has another deep commitment to leadership, equity, access, um, and diversity on our campus as well. But our new Unity Scholarship Program at Gonzaga is launching this year, um, and our counselors are really, really excited for it. So the Unity Scholarship Program is a separate application-based scholarship program for Washington State residents. Um, and I'll drop that link in the chat in just a little bit so you can, can hear more more about it. Um, and this scholarship program is a replacement for our Act 6 scholarship from a couple of years back. And it basically allows us to expand the work of these scholarships too. So this grant program offers four years of covering the cost of tuition, fees, housing, and meal plan charges at Gonzaga. Um, and this program offers enrollment in our bridge pre-orientation program, as well as a four-year leadership cohort supported by our Unity Multicultural Education Center. Um, so if you're a wa Washington State resident who's dem demonstrated a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging efforts, um, as well as a high financial need, this could be a great program to also apply for by January 1st on our website. And then I'll pass it off to Sarah. Thank you. I've seen a couple of questions related to this come up in the chat, um, but, you know, essentially the FAFSA is going to require you to submit information about your 2022 income. And we're aware that might not be an accurate reflection of your current financial situation. And we have a process to take that into consideration, um, which we refer to as a financial aid appeal or a special circumstances appeal. Um, you can see some common requests we see we receive for appeals on the screen there, and there's a lot more information on our website. Um, we're in the process of updating our processes for the 24-25 school year, so we're not quite ready to sort of take those appeals yet. We also want to make sure that, you, that your, you or your student have been accepted and that you received a financial aid offer before we will begin processing those appeals. But stay tuned. We'll continue to update that um, information on our website. Uh, know, though, that the first step, what we're going to ask you to do before we consider any sort of special circumstances is to submit a, a FAFSA or WASPA or a need analysis application. So the FAFSA, most students are going to be eligible to do the FAFSA. Um, and so unless you are not a U.S. citizen, um, the FAFSA application is what you're going to want to do. And once you've done that, um, you'll receive a financial aid award and you're welcome to connect with our office about next steps to submit an appeal. So another helpful office to become familiar with is our Office of Student Accounts. And I know that for many of you, this feels like a long time away, like you'll start to engage with student accounts in July, but there's some families who are really curious about kind of payment options and how it all works. And so we like to just take a minute and highlight sort of what our student accounts office does. So they are responsible for preparing and distributing billing statements and doing the collections for tuition fees, room and board, and um, other fees that students might incur during their time at Gonzaga. Um, they're going to process payment. They're going to help coordinate those 529 uh, payments if your family um, has an education savings account. Um, they also are going to help set up payment plans and disperse financial aid or um, credit balance refunds if your financial aid and payments exceed what the school has charged you. 
Um, it's really important. Um, and again, we're going to plug this all throughout the process that you maintain effective communication. Um, student accounts office is great. Um, and they're really committed to helping students and families in pursuit of their educational goals. Um, and know that they are as flexible as they possibly can. And we have many families who use like multiple sort of services here to figure out how to, to make this all work and support their student financially at Gonzaga. And of course, you'll have several options to choose from um, when making payments. Again, we have families that might use a, a combination of savings or investments, as well as a loan, maybe a parent loan and a payment plan, and know that all of those things can be accommodated. And when you are ready to discuss those, um, our student accounts team will be happy to help you do that. Awesome. So um, that pretty much concludes our presentation portion of tonight's webinar. And we hope this information has helped to clarify our financial aid process, our, our processes here at Gonzaga. Um, I saw a lot of questions and answers um, in the chat, but um, I hope this gives you a sense of what you and your family can prepare for financially here at GU. Um, but now it's time to address some of those questions um, left in the Q&A chat. So feel free to drop any um, last minute questions in there, but hopefully we can get a couple last minute ones answered for students. Um, so we'll take a look and wait on those. So I see Sarah is answering one of the questions on needs analysis forms. Um, um, Becky, can I um, just highlight some of the stuff on the screen real quick definitely. on our slide? So one of the things, just kind of tips for success, is know that this is true both in the admissions world and the financial aid world, is as deadlines uh, approach, we tend to get busier. So by and large, we'll we are well staffed and have systems in place to help make sure people get answered. But um, it's super helpful when you can start those things early and start to figure out what questions you might have so you're not panicked on a deadline trying to get a hold of, of someone in an office. So um, especially now, um, you guys are already ahead of the game listening to this webinar and getting information, but um, starting the applications as early as possible is great. And then the other thing I would just like to highlight here is there are lots of people who will gladly take your money um, without much in return, particularly around this, this college access stuff. So be wary of anything that sounds too good to be true, like millions of scholarships unclaimed or where you have to pay for a subscription to apply for a scholarship. The other thing I'd like to point out, and I say this because I have a teenager as well, a sophomore in high school, is that sometimes the scholarship applications are really just sort of like fronts for sort of collecting information. Um, so again, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, this goes for scholarship applications for job offers. Um, unfortunately, there's some like bad actors out there who might not be wholesome in their kind of request and maybe trying to, you know, mine for information. So if you're not sure, we're always happy to check the legitimacy or just make sure it's connected to like a, an organization, all of those kind of cybersecurity tips. But just some things to think about as you are um, either navigating this process yourself or helping your student navigate the process. No, that's great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for jumping in um, before we got into any of those questions or anything like that. But definitely one of the biggest things, like just like Sarah mentioned about the financial aid office, like always being available for you guys and definitely like lean on them as a resource, even about like financial aid in general, not just for financial aid at Gonzaga University. And I think that's something that is really unique about Gonzaga is really caring about each and every student and applicant that comes through our doors. Um, so if you have any questions, always feel free to like reach out to financial aid office as well as our admissions office because we would love to hear from you guys um, and really be able to answer any questions that you guys might have going through the process. Um, but it looks like we might have a couple questions coming in and one for the Unity Scholarship. Um, so is it worth applying if your family income is below 70% of Washington's median, um, e.g. $80,000 or out of this range? So um, I assume if you mean like um, if you are um, earning more than that $80,000 for, for a family of four range. And I'd say like, it's definitely still worth applying to. It's just, we're gonna give priority to those families that demonstrate really high financial need during the scholarship process. So it's a combination of merit as well as financial need too. So I would say it's definitely still worth applying to, especially if you demonstrate that commitment towards social justice, diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging. Um, if you have a student that's really interested in that, I'd say it's definitely worth applying to as well, but great question. 
Um, I want to take a, a second just to clarify a couple of things around which application to apply to. So first, uh, again, the vast majority of our students uh, are going to be eligible to submit that FAFSA application, and that is the application that you should submit. So whether you're in state or out of state, um, if you are a U.S. citizen or uh, essentially an eligible non-citizen, like a permanent resident, you would be eligible to submit a FAFSA application, and that probably encompasses the majority of our students. Um, students who do not meet the citizenship requirement are welcome to do those other applications, but again, you would only be doing those um, if you do not meet that citizenship requirement. And if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to our office and we can help direct you um, to complete the right application. Awesome. And I'm trying to see if there's any other last minute questions in the chat from folks. Um, and I think the last question is, when should the need analysis form be completed and where is it located on the website? Um, so so again, yeah, the need analysis is that that that's an application that very few students are going to be required to commit. So um, if you think you might need to do that, that might just be a good opportunity to get in touch with our office so we can guide you through that and confirm that you're doing the correct application. Awesome. And then do you offer application fee waivers on the common application if you currently have a student enrolled at Gonzaga? I know we have an alumni fee waiver, but I'm not sure if we have any current student fee waivers for applications. Um. This would be your area more than mine, um, but I bet your student at Gonzaga might know some alums who could uh, apply for that fee waiver. That might be how I put it. Yeah, and I I bet the I bet if you reach out to the admission office, they might be able to connect you with alum who would love to give you a fee waiver. Um, so definitely, I would suggest reaching out to your counselor or myself, um, and we can try and connect you with an alumni. And yes, an uncle would qualify. Really, anyone that you know that graduated from Gonzaga can um provide the information for that fee waiver and do the essays in common app have any influence on financial aid consideration so no it wouldn't have consideration on financial aid consideration but it definitely has a consideration for your merit scholarship so when we're reading applications we read everything you submit to us so that could be letters of recommendation, essays, writing supplements. Um, so make sure you're really taking some time on those and tell us what you're passionate about during um, those essay questions. So yes, they do. The Common App essay does have an influence on merit scholarships for admissions office, but great question. Awesome. So I think that that's all we have, unless Sarah, you have anything else you wanted to add before we log off? No, just thank you. Thanks for your participation and engagement. It always makes it more fun on our end. So we appreciate you being here. Awesome. So it's been a really big pleasure sharing this information with you all this evening. And we really appreciate your guys' time taking, you know, time out of your Tuesday night to come up or and hang out with us. Um, but please check out our in-person and virtual visit options this year. Um, we do offer campus tours, information sessions, um, student panels, meetings with faculty, current students as well. So definitely lots of opportunities to connect with us here at GU too. Um, so just make sure you have um, those opportunities. But we offer faculty and current students meetings, as well as in-person preview days that are really, really popular for students coming out to campus. Um, but overall, thanks so much for attending and for your interest in being a Zag. We look forward to reading your applications, guys. But thanks all. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Looks like all the questions are answered. So um, thanks all for being here and from the financial aid office and everyone who attended. So thanks, guys.